Um, if you don't mind, I'll be recording this lecture. So I'll share this with my other class, the Langley class. And also share this with you on Moodle. So if you want to review anything, preparing for uh, the final exam, you're going to have the video. Hopefully by tomorrow, if not tomorrow, on Wednesday. Is it okay with you? Yeah? All right, so uh, this last chapter, sales and consumer uh, protection. Why do we look at this? Because sale, trans uh, sale transactions, they are very common in business uh, life. And also, uh, in terms of con uh, consumer protections, similarly to tenants or residential tenancy, consumers, they are usually the weakest party in a consumer transaction. Usually the company, the business, they are stronger. So consumers, we as consumers, we are protected by both provincial and federal legislation in Canada. Okay, so that's why we look at those uh, two topics. So we'll start by looking at the Sale of Goods Act. It is an important act and we'll go through some details. And then we'll also be checking title and risk. So title means ownership. I own something, I have the title. And then risk, whoever owns the product or has title will bear the risk. We'll uh, check some details uh, right there. And then rights and obligations of buyers and sellers, remedies for both of them. And then we're going to look at consumer uh, legislation, uh, consumer protection legislation, a little bit of Competition Act, and then uh, provincial legislation for consumers, and, and looking at negotiable instruments. Okay, so that's uh, our menu uh, for the night. So what is the Sale of Goods Act? It is an act that will fill the gaps will aid, will help, will fill the gaps in uh, sales transactions, sale contracts. So we buy goods. I know you, I, I told you already, I know you buy goods from Amazon almost on a daily basis. So people buy from Amazon a lot, for example. And we buy online. If there are terms of that contract, uh, if part of that contract uh, does not prescribe some obligations and duties that are in the Sale of Goods Act, the Sale of Goods Act terms, they will fill in those gaps. Okay? So there are some implied uh, terms that will be present in all uh, sale transactions. So that's the main uh, idea of the Sale of Goods Act. But because a sale transaction is a contractual transaction, is a contractual relationship, the contract, the sale contract prevails. The sale contract is the law among the parties. Only when the sale contract is silent, then the Sale of Goods Act will apply. Okay? So we call this a subsidiary application. It is not direct. It is only in parts that the sale contract is silent. And the Sale of Goods Act, they are not restricted to a retail and consumer transaction. They will also apply for commercial transactions. So business to consumer, but also business to business. Okay? So let's look into more details um, so that you can picture what I'm talking about. So the Sale of Goods Act, they will apply for goods. And goods we saw in chapter 14. Goods are also known as chattels and they are tangible items. So if, if I'm buying a, a table, chair, laptop, 
smartphone, whatever tangible I'm buying, the sale uh, of goods act will apply. Okay? That's when uh, this act applies. It does not apply to real property, and you may remember what is the definition of real property we saw last week, chapter 14. What is real property? Don't make me concerned. What is real property? Land and anything permanently attached to the land. So the Sale of Goods Act will not apply to real property transactions. Okay? And for services, so selling a service, sale of a service, the Act does not apply either. There's an exception that if you bought, you purchased goods, and then the services were related to installing those goods, then the act will apply. So let's say you purchased a software, and along with the purchase of software, installation, um, you have a right for installation. So this, the act will apply to this. Or another simple example, when uh, October comes, most people or some uh, drivers here in Canada, they buy winter tires. So you were buying the goods, chattels, tangible items, and you usually you get them installed, right? You replace your all-season tires for winter tires. So that would apply in this situation. Okay, is this example clear? But if you go to the dentist and you have your uh, tooth filled, this is just a service. The act doesn't apply. Okay? If you have your boots repaired, if you have a smartphone repaired, it's a service uh, as well. Okay? It was a reward. And it doesn't apply to choices in action as well. And remember, choices in action, they are a type of uh, personal property, intangible. So they are rights we have against someone. Uh, negotiable instruments are choices in action, as we saw, shares, um, checks, so they are examples. So the act will not apply to those. The act will apply to goods, chattels, tangible items. Make no mistake, there will be one question in your final exam asking you in what situation will the sale, the act, sorry, the sale of goods act apply, okay? And we will also uh, practice in a while. So when, are, when is title transferred? So we buy goods, you go to Best Buy and you buy a laptop. When is title transferred? When do you actually own the laptop? Because once you have title, if there's any loss to the goods, you bear the loss. Do you remember some, let's say, uh, four, five years ago, this guy in Australia purchased the first iPhone, iPhone 5, 6, I don't remember which one, Australia because they were the first store open in the world, purchased, went out, someone was recording, and then he, the guy was showing the first iPhone, and then the iPhone fell. And then the screen was broken. So who bears the loss? Would Apple bear the loss? Would the person, the guy, bear the loss? What do you think? Okay. The policy is a very important thing because the policy will apply specifically to um, companies and their transactions. But in terms of law, uh, legal concepts, the owner of the iPhone would bear the loss. 
because in most transactions, in most, in most sale transactions, title passes immediately. When we buy it, title passes to us. Seller and purchaser, they may agree in a different timing for the title to pass from seller to buyer. But when there's no agreement, in general, title will pass immediately. So the guy got title, ownership, his iPhone fell on the floor and he would have to exchange this. Okay? So that's why it is important for us to uh, know when we have title of a product. So the title of goods, they have to be transferred for the sale, um, sale of goods act to apply. But transferring this title, as I said, may be negotiated between seller and buyer. So they may say, title will not pass until I pay uh, the last installment. Or title will not pass until tomorrow when I take delivery of the product. So parties can negotiate when title will pass, right? If there's no negotiation, title usually passes right away in the moment of the transaction. So when we go to any store to purchase any goods, chattels, title passes immediately, okay? Uh, if there's a sale in which the goods, the chattel, is securing the debt transaction, the loan, the act does not apply either. Remember we saw last chapter 15, when we finance a car, so the car is used as a security for the financial institution, for the bank. So in this case, uh, and I'm using the example on the contrary, but when it's securing a loan, uh, the act will not apply. And my example is not correct for the finance car, because if the security is the product you are buying, then the act applies, because you are actually buying the car. But if you are using a product, a different product you have, a different channel you have, to secure a loan, then it doesn't, the act will not apply. The best example would be the pawn shop, the pledge transaction I shared with you last week. So if I go to a pawn shop, and I give possession of my jewelry to the pawn shop owner, and I get a loan, so the act will not apply, because I'm actually getting a loan, okay? But if I'm financing the car, uh, I'm using the car I'm buying, so I'm buying a channel, a tangible good, and even though I'm financing the car, because the car is used as, as a security, the act we will apply uh, as an exception. Okay? Uh, barter or exchange. If there's no money involved, the act doesn't apply. So, I have an iPhone um, 6 and you have an iPhone 7, but uh, yours has some issues, some scratches. So if we exchange one for the other, no one is involved, the act doesn't apply. But if you pay me something or if I pay you something, then the act will apply. So when there's money involved in exchange, in barter, the act applies. But again, I'm giving you examples and I'm telling you that the act applies, but the act will only apply to fill in the gaps. Because if we come into a, a sale contract, the contract is our main law. Only the gaps in this contract will be filled by the Sale of Goods Act. Okay? When the act applies. Are we good so far? <clears throat> right. So, a question similar to this may be in your final exam. Is it 
D? E. E, e sorry, E. Yeah. A contract for the purchase of a house. What is a house? Sorry? Real property. Okay. And does the act apply for real property? No, it doesn't apply for real property. But e, A? A? Why do you think uh, A? Uh, what, what is the good in here? The table. Table. Yes. The table is the only tangible goods we have as an example in here. This one may sound a bit tricky because it is saying that uh, title will not pass until some future date. But when title passes, because it is a, an intangib a tangible good, a chattel, then the act would apply. Clear? So it's just a bit tricky because of the end, but table is a good, so the act applies. Um, assignment of a company's accounts receivable. What is account? What is a company's accounts receivable? What property is this? How do we call this? Sorry. term is an asset, yes, but in law we call this as chose in action. Remember the rights we have against someone, they are chosen action. And for chosen action, the act would not apply. Okay? C. Uh, a TV is traded for a computer and it doesn't say there's money involved. If there's no money involved, the act would not apply. And then the dentist uh, filling a tooth, as I said, it's a service, okay? And the house is a real property, so it will not apply. Clear? Good, moving on. So risk will always follow title. Once you get the title, the risk is with you. So the example of the iPhone that fell down, that fell uh, to the floor. So the guy had just purchased it, so got the risk. Let's say you buy something at IKEA. You pay, but you tell them, I'm taking delivery only tomorrow. I cannot carry the goods tonight. So title is not passing yet. If there's an unfortunate event <clears throat> that IKEA catches fire, during the night, you have not lost your goods. Even though you paid for them, you didn't take delivery yet. So you did not get the title yet. Right? That's why title is important. We negotiate the sale of my car. So you buy my car. You may write a check to me today, you may e transfer the amount partially, but I tell you that I will deliver the car to you tomorrow, not tonight. And we agree. Maybe you'll pay me tomorrow, but we signed the agreement today. Again, title would not pass until I deliver it to you. So if I'm driving home tonight, if I'm driving to give, uh, to give delivery to you tomorrow, and I suffer an accident or I cause an accident, I will bear the loss, right? So that's why title is important in terms of risk. Who bears the risk? Who has title of the goods? Clear? That's very important. So when there's a sale, title usually transfers immediately, as I said, usually, but parties, seller and buyer, they can agree otherwise if they want. If not, it, uh, title will transfer immediately. And the agreement to sell, we saw it last week. In agreement to sell, the example I've given you was when the developer or the construction company, they are financially strong, so I pay to the construction company in 10 years, in 20 years, 
And then when I pay the last installment, the construction company or the developer will then transfer title to me. Remember? So it's just reviewing what we saw last week. The agreement to sell is I have possession of the um, of the goods, but I give you an example about real property. So I have possession of real property right away, but I only get title after I pay the last installment. Okay? Here for goods could be the same. So if a company buys machinery and they are paying 12 installments, 24, 36, they may have possession right away, but if they come into an agreement to sell, title will only pass in a future date. Right? Good. Have you ever heard about INCO terms? This expression, INCO terms? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you've heard of any of them, CIF or FOB, COD, have you heard of uh, some of them? So they are highly used in international business transactions. Not only, they may be used domestically, but they are highly used in international business transactions. So the INCO terms, the current ones, they are the uh, 20 and 10, but a new edition is just coming. If it hasn't come last year, it's just about to come. It started in 1936, and they are terms that Companies, sellers and buyers, they can use as per title and as per risk. So for example, when I buy goods, let's say I'm importing goods from uh, South Korea, and I'm importing them into Canada. When I negotiate with my supplier, I may negotiate CIF, meaning the price of the item of the goods, will include the good itself plus insurance and plus international freight. So when I negotiate CIF, I'm not only paying for the goods, I'm paying for goods, insurance if anything happens to the goods, and also international freight. Is this clear? Why would I negotiate CIF? I would negotiate CIF if my supplier has a better relationship with insurance companies and with international freight companies. So they would get a better rate, not only for the freight, but also for insurance, for the premium. But eventually, I have a good relationship with a freight company. And also, my goods, I don't want insurance. If thing goes bad, it's fine, but I don't want to have insurance. So I may decide to buy FOB, Freedom Board. When I buy FOB, I'm paying for the cost of goods. Plus, the domestic transportation in the supplier's country, because the goods have to travel from the factory to the port to be loaded, right? And they also have to be cleared. So customs have to be cleared for export, okay? So once the supplier delivers the cargo, the container, let's say, at the port, on board, title is being transferred. Risk is all mine. If my container is dumped, on the sea because of any issues with the vessel and I don't have insurance I may buy insurance when I buy FOB as a buyer I will buy insurance insurance is not included in the cost SCAF but if I don't have insurance I will bear the loss right and the same and another one would be COD called cash on delivery this I would say would be a lot used domestically. So remember the example I used in the past. I have a coffee store, I don't, it's just an example. And let's say 
My fresh croissant supplier comes every morning to deliver fresh croissants and our terms, our negotiated terms are COD. So upon delivery I pay cash, I write a check, I make an e-transfer. Right? If my supplier has an accident, the truck has an accident during delivery, who bears the loss? The supplier, exactly, because it is cash on delivery. Until I take delivery, I don't pay. Product is not mine. Title has not transferred. But if I had to uh, purchase FOB, I would need to arrange transportation from my supplier's place to my company. Clear? And suppliers, they know this. If they, are, if they have negotiated COD, they will add to their cost a risk margin. They have to, because it just may happen. Bad things happen, right? There are about 20 negotiated terms. I'm just sharing three with you. There's one, for example, that is X works. It is, the term is X works. X works means the supplier delivers the goods at their manufacturing place. So it's the cheapest negotiated term I can have. My supplier finishes manufacturing the goods. I need to get the goods in my supplier's premises, have them transported to the port. I have to bear the costs for export clearance international freight, insurance, etc. Here, we're just giving you an example of another one. So X-Works would be the cheapest one because the supplier is just manufacturing the goods and making them available at their premises. As a buyer, I have to arrange everything else. So, so I would say internationally speaking, those two are the most common ones. FOB, because I want my supplier to deliver the goods cleared customs in the, in the port of origin, and then I arrange uh, sea freight, etc. Or CIF, I want my supplier to arrange everything and deliver to me here, port of Vancouver. Okay? Are you following? Is this okay? We have this document. This is a document, the Bill of Land. It is not an, a, an inventory. It is just a document. What is a Bill of Land? The document that a carrier, carrier is usually the sea freight company or sea freight agent, uh, airway bill is used for air companies. So if you have goods transported by air, the similar document will be called airway bill. For sea transportation vessel, the document will be called bill of landing, usually abbreviated, used as BL. So the BL, the bill of landing is this document that the transportation company, the carrier, will issue acknowledging they have received the cargo. They are not acknowledging the quality of the goods. They are not acknowledging the quantity of goods. Most of times the container is locked by the supplier. They are just acknowledging, they are just informing the buyer that they have received the container. And from that time on, they are responsible for the goods because they are transporting. So using some concepts from last week, once they issue the bill of lending, the transportation company and the buyer, they are in a bailment transaction. Remember the temporary possession of goods, bailment? So it's gonna be bailment. But keep in mind the bill of lending is just a document 
acknowledging receipt of goods. Okay? It's not a document transferring title, giving title. By the way, in international business transactions, um, the supplier sends the container to the port. The carrier will issue a BL, Bill of Lending. The original BL, the original Bill of Lending, will be sent to the seller, to the supplier. The supplier will release this original to the seller, sorry, to the buyer, after the buyer has paid for the goods. Because the buyer in their home country, they cannot clear import without the original bill of lending. But if they have not paid for the goods, if they had to pay before the cargo arrives, this is a way the supplier holds the document and forces the buyer to pay. Okay? Right. So, transfer of title in case parties have not negotiated when title will transfer. Because again, the Sale of Goods Act will only fill in the gaps. So in case parties have not negotiated when title will transfer, those five rules of the Act will apply. So what are those five rules? The first one says that in an unconditional contract, a contract without condition, a contract which you go to Apple and you buy a smartphone, you go to Best Buy and you buy goods. You go to Canadian Tire and you buy goods. So that's an unconditional contract. This one, title transfer immediately. Okay? You may take delivery tomorrow if you want. And you may mention that the title will only transfer tomorrow. But if you don't mention this, the act will say, title transfers immediately. Here, when a task has to be completed so that the goods are in a deliverable state, then title will just transfer when the goods are in a deliverable state. The example I'm bringing to you is repair. So, my uh, smartphone screen is broken. I take it to the repair shop. The owner of the shop has temporary title of the goods while they are repairing my smartphone. While they are repairing, if there's a break-in in the store, my smartphone is stolen. I don't bear the loss. But then after it is fixed, they call me and they say it's ready for pickup, then title will come to me again. Okay? So it's very important for you to know those issues regarding title because title falls risk. Okay? Once we get title, we have the risk. Um, when goods, they have to be either weighed or measured, then only after they are weighed and the buyer is notified about the weight or measurement, then title will transfer. So if you have purchased one ton of rocks, construction rocks, or 500 uh, kilograms or pounds of meat for a barbecue for a lot of people. So only after the goods are weighted and you are notified about the weight, title will transfer. Okay? Not before. That's the third rule. Uh, the fourth rule is when goods, they are subject to approval. In my home country, in Brazil, 
there's this, uh, you might see, there was this uh, decoration store for uh, home furniture, but they had those uh, beautiful sofas and, and everything for the house decoration. They allowed customers to have the products in their house for a week, for example, testing the product, and then they would say, oh, I liked this sofa, so I'm taking it. So until they inform the store, they have approved, the title had not transferred yet. Just after I informed the seller that, yes, I approve the goods. We have uh, car test drives, but we usually drive while we are checking uh, what car we want to buy. We usually don't buy that car. But if it is the case, that the car dealership for a brand new car or a used car allows you to drive the car you are going to buy or you're planning on buying. You can drive it for one day or two days. Then you will, you will either confirm the purchase or not. Only after you confirm purchase, title will transfer. Okay? While you haven't confirmed, the car dealership still owns the car. Uh, and they have the risk. And the last, uh, the last rule is when the goods have to be manufactured. Those are companies, usually for furniture as well. Their furniture in their store, they are only for display. They are not for sale. So I may go to a furniture uh, store, uh, let's say for office furniture. I see this table and this chair over there but I cannot buy them. They are just for this thing. If I want to buy them, they have to order from the manufacturer. So they don't keep stocks. It's cheaper for them, for the store. So when goods have to be manufactured, have to be gotten from the manufacturing plant or from a warehouse far away, until I receive the goods as they were displayed, title does not pass to me. Just after I accept the goods that are in the delivery state. Here. So if parties have not negotiated when title transfers, those rules they may apply, depending on the situation, depending on how goods will be delivered. Any questions? Doubts? No? Any question? No. All right. So, moving on. Rights and obligations of the parties. And parties here are seller and buyer. So, there's an implied term coming out of the uh, Sale of Goods Act that says conditions, there will be conditions and warranties in all contracts. And we saw what warranties and conditions are when we saw contract law. So in all contracts, there will be conditions and warranties. Remember what a condition is? No one remembers? Anyone? A major term. Sorry? Lean? Mm -hmm. uh, condition in contract law would be the major term of an agreement. The major thing we are bargaining for. In the examples I used with you those lectures ago was I would purchase a Porsche Cayenne and they would deliver me a Porsche Macan. So it's different. Cars are different. So they would be breaching a Okay? And warranty. What is warranty? Warranty is a minor term of a contract. The example I used with you was I ordered a Porsche with leather seats, but they delivered me the same Porsche I ordered, but with cloth seats. Cloth seats, they, they are just a warranty. 
because the car is still the same, same engine, same car, etc. So, when a condition is broken, is not complied with, and again, just reviewing, we can ignore, as a victim, we can ignore and accept the goods, but in most cases, we will not. What we will do, we will not accept the goods. And we can still sue for damages. And if we have paid something, we can get that amount back. I've always used other examples with you. You go to uh, Tim Hortons to buy coffee, and they give you tea. Condition was breached. Right? A major term. You wanted coffee, not tea. And you got tea. So you get your money back and you just leave. You order this Porsche Cayenne, they try to deliver you a Porsche Macan, you say, no, he don't want. The condition was breached. Right? So you get your money back. And you are not bound to buy that car to buy that car. But when there's a warranty, a warranty is breached, and warranty being a minor term, we are bound to move ahead with the deal. We are not released from the deal. So I order coffee with two milk, and I usually take non-fat milk, but they made it 2% milk. I'm still getting two milk, but not the milk I want. And if I have no health restrictions, it's just a warranty. So I still need to get the, uh, the coffee. Okay? But I can sue for damages. My Porsche. I don't know if Porsche would ever deliver a car with cloth seats. But let's say I got a Porsche with cloth seats. Well, first of all, my enjoyment is not the same. Second of all, resale value will be affected. So, but I still have to buy that car but I can sue for damages I have, okay? So the act, the Sale of Goods Act, say they prescribe that conditions, when they are breached, they release the victim. But warranty, when they are breached, they, are, they do not release the victim. The victim still has to move ahead with it, but can sue for damages. Clear? Uh, companies, manufacturers, retailers, they usually try to use the exemption clauses. Remember the exemption clauses? Examples I, I've given you, they were, you were buying this laptop from Best Buy, but you were buying the one that is on display. So they have an exemption clause saying that they are not responsible for scratches, for minor issues that may have in this displayed item, okay? But remember, the exemption clauses, they are only legal and valid if they are brought to the attention of the buyer in the moment of purchase, not later on. If you see the exemption clause just in the invoice after you paid for the goods, they are not applicable. You have to see them before you buy the goods so you make an informed decision, okay? Uh, what else? <sighs> Provincial legislation, they will also uh, sometimes either prohibit or limit uh, some of those exclusions, exclusions and also uh, they will guarantee fitness and quality for products. So you purchase a laptop. The laptop is not working well. Well, this is a condition because you purchase a laptop to use it as a laptop. So regardless if the manufacturer or the seller told you that they are not liable for any issues with the product, legislation says that fitness and quality of the product have to be complied with. Okay, so you purchase a smartphone that is not working properly. You purchase uh, tires uh, that just got damaged after 
let's say 50, 100 kilometers. So fitness and quality of the product would be affected. And we are protected by legislation. Yes? It doesn't it depend on the like, price or not? Because some products are like, cheap and they just don't have that, you know? That's a good question. Uh, yes, we do have uh, cheaper products, uh, but they still have to offer consumers the minimum quality. So if I'm buying tires, even though I'm not buying uh, uh, famous, bar, uh, famous brands, but they still have to work as a tire. Maybe a famous one will be good for 20 or 40,000 kilometers. The one I'm purchasing is just for 10,000. That's okay, I know this. But they have to, to function as a tire. And if about 100 kilometers, 500 kilometers, they display quality issues, then we are entitled for replacement or damages. Okay, but that's a good question. Yes, quality may differ. Yes, they may. But they cannot affect the main, um, the main characteristic of the product we are buying. Okay? Uh, good. What are some of uh, the obligations of the seller? So seller, as per the Act, the Sale of Goods Act, they have to convey good title and quiet possession. What is good title? Good title means that title of the product is free. So when I buy the product, there are no restrictions on the product. Remember we saw last week, last week we saw that we can use channels, goods, as a security for a loan, right? So goods that are under security, if they are not in a floating charge, as we saw last week, they cannot be sold because they do not offer good title. They have a restriction. Okay? So good title means the title is free of any liens, free of any restrictions. And quiet possession, our possession of the goods cannot be interfered with. Okay, so when I purchase products, goods, I cannot have possession of the goods interfered with by the seller. So those are uh, implied terms. Also, the goods, they have to be usable, free of liens, they have to match the description if we buy from a catalog, if we buy from, uh, if we buy online and we see the description online, they have to match that description. If they don't, they have breached. Uh, they have to be merchant of merchantable quality, also match sample and be free of hidden defects. So you got a sample product, you tried it, you liked it, so now you want to buy the product, they have to match sample. And in BC only, they have to be durable. But durable here is quite subjective, because most companies for the last 10, 15 years, they are not manufacturing durable goods anymore. They want us to be replacing our goods. I don't know if it happened to you, but it happened to me. My mom, when she purchased her first fridge, it lasted for 30, 40 years maybe. Nowadays, refrigerators or fridges, they last for six years, 10 years. So they are not as durable as they were in the past. But it's still in the BC legislation. They have to be durable, uh, which is quite subjective. Some other uh, implied terms. A reasonable price has to be paid. So if you see goods without a price, tag, we cannot consider it is for free. A reasonable price has to be paid. Okay? Also, time of delivery or uh, maybe a condition or a warranty. But it depends on the nature of the conduct and the contract. 
Let's say I would be offering coffee break to you, dinner to you tonight. I purchased dinner, and it should be here at 7.30. It was not here at 7.30. Because you would be living here at 8, 8.30. So it means if dinner is not here by 7.30, it would be a condition. Right? And when a condition is breached, I am relieved from my obligations. I don't need to accept the dinner coming late. Okay? But if dinner is here at 7.30, and one of the dishes, they, are, they were changed, was not the one I ordered, then this changed dish would be a warranty, not a condition. Okay? So it depends on the circumstances. Uh, also, the purchaser can choose to return or keep the goods when the quantity that is delivered is wrong. So this is at the discretion of the purchaser. And satisfaction or right to have money back is not an implied term. So when you buy something and you are not satisfied, but there are no issues with the product. You are not satisfied. You don't have a right to have your money back. Legally speaking, why? Because some companies, they have a policy. Home Depot, we can return goods up to 90 days. Apple, 14 days or 30 days, if I'm not mistaken. And as they say, no questions asked. If we didn't like or if we changed our mind, but this is on the company's policy, not legally speaking. Legally speaking, if you purchase something, that store does not have a refund or returning policy, and you didn't like, you were not satisfied with the product, you have to give it or sell it to someone else. Okay? Question for you. What do you think? B. Which one? Uh, B. B. Bob. The buyer's promise satisfaction or the right to get his money back. Yeah, we just said this is not a right. Okay. Any questions in any other alternatives? No? All right. So when one of the parties default in a sale transaction, either the seller or the buyer, so if the, uh, sorry, yeah, seller or buyer. So if the buyer defaults on payment, for example, the seller can retain the goods. So you should have paid for the goods before I delivered the product to you. You didn't pay. So I don't deliver, I hold the goods. This is a right, okay, upon default. Uh, if I'm already, Delivering, I can stop delivering because you haven't paid. So this is a remedy. Or I can recover after delivery up to 30 days, but just for the unpaid part. So you purchased those 20 chairs. You gave a down payment that covers two of those 20 chairs or 30 chairs. There's still 30. 28 unpaid, so I can get them back up to 30 days, okay? Uh, this is also uh, a right. What else? The seller will have a priority over other creditors. This is their priority, actually, recovering the goods that were not paid, as we saw in bankruptcy last week, and can sue for breach of contract and also damages. So I may decide to deliver you the goods, even though you haven't paid me as we agreed. And then I'll go to court and I'll sue you 
for breach of contract plus any other damages I may have. Let's say I was counting on your payment to pay my supplier. Because I couldn't pay my supplier, I was incurred interest, penalties, fines, so I could sue you for those. Okay? But all victims of a breach of contract, they have to mitigate the loss. This is a contract law concept we saw already. So let's say I would deliver fresh croissants to your company. You didn't pay me, so I decided not to deliver. I cannot just uh, get rid of the croissants. I would try to sell them to other coffee shops to mitigate my loss. Okay, but I would try. I am not forced to, but at least I have to try. The buyer remedies, they are the ones we have in contract law. <clears throat> Suing for breach, rescission, as we saw, uh, when there's a breach of condition or warranty, those remedies. But we can also sue for damages. We can withhold payment if there's a breach of a condition. The Porsche Macan, they're trying to deliver me, but I ordered this Porsche Cayenne. I will not pay the remaining. Or I will have to go ahead with the deal if a warranty is breached, but I can sue for damages. Okay? Those are the remedies for the buyer. Online sales and international transactions. So, uh, <clears throat> what do I need to share here with you? For international transactions, it's hard to say there's a right answer. We law applies. So if you purchase something from eBay, the supplier is in China, is in Vietnam, is in Hong Kong, is in South Korea. What law applies? South Korean law? Canadian law? Any other law? So it depends on the terms and conditions of your purchase. So it's not easy to uh, enforce our rights in international transactions. We are in a more uh, riskier uh, position or situation. For online transactions, uh, when we click I accept terms and conditions, we are actually accepting the agreement. So whatever the agreement, the terms and conditions say, we are bound by those. Okay. We may have some remedies if any of those terms and conditions, they are abusive. But we cannot be certain if we will sue here in Canada or in another country. There are several factors that will influence and we uh, just don't go uh, into details on those. In terms of consumer protection, so as I said, Consumers, they are known to be the weakest party in a sale transaction. So, whenever goods are intended, are intended for consumption, not resale, then we have a consumer transaction. And legislation will mostly control, regulate the use and disclosure of information and also advertising, so exaggerated advertising false or misleading advertising. Those are prohibited practices. And also safety, quality of the goods. Uh, safety in terms of properly labeled, detailed instructions of use. What age can use this or that. And also there may be some uh, unethical uh, business practices that are protected by consumer legislations. And we have both provincial and federal legislation in place. So first of all, we rely on provincial legislation. Then if the provincial legislation is silent in one or other aspect, the federal legislation applies, fills uh, the gaps. We also have the Competition Act. The Competition Act is intended to prevent some business activities that either theoretically or in practice, they interfere with a free market. And those 
um, we'll see some examples uh, of those. The Competition Act also regulates mergers and acquisitions because the government wants to control creation of monopoly. Let's say, what if Tim Hortons purchased Starbucks here in Canada? There could be a monopoly. <coughs> or the opposite, Starbucks purchases Tim Hortons. So this type of transaction has to be approved by the government. The government may not approve, sometimes may approve with some conditions. They could say, yes, Tim Hortons, you can, uh, you can buy Starbucks. But you cannot change the brand, the logo, the furniture. You have to keep Starbucks as they are. You own them, but you have to keep as they are. So this is just an example. If they ever approved such merger or acquisition. So yes? Facebook and Instagram merchant will be a good example. Facebook and I don't think this transaction needed to be approved. Because um, I don't see a, I don't see a monopoly examples in the online world yet. So I don't think authorities in the U.S. they regarded this transaction as a uh, threat for monopoly in terms of uh, social media. Okay, but examples, uh, clear examples are uh, this one didn't never happen, but. If Starbucks wants to buy Tim Hortons, so they are two huge companies. They work in the same sector in the, in, uh, in here in Canada and other countries as well. There were some mergers uh, with uh, chocolate companies. I don't remember which ones. I think Nestle and some others. So governments had to approve them. What other examples that I can think of? Let's say uh, when one. Big company buys a company of the same industry, same sector, because they are trying to dominate the market. I think, for example, Monsanto, they have purchased a lot of companies. I believe some of their transactions had to be approved because they would impact uh, a free market. Okay? And there are some prohib uh, prohibits some uh, abusive trade practices that are prohibited under the Competition Act. Those are conspiracy, bait and switch advertising, parent selling. And I have an asterisk on them because in this next slide, I'm not reading it, but you have a definition for them. What bait and switch advertising is and what parent selling is. Okay? That are, that are also civil and criminal uh, process that may arise from the Competition Act and they uh, may apply to online sales depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, for the first, preventing business activities that interfere with a free market. So let's say, uh, have you ever been to Kwantlen, Surrey? The campus in Surrey? Let's say all coffee shops there, they come into an agreement to sell small coffee for $5. There's no competition. This is known as cartel. This is prohibited. In my country, here I don't think it's, it happens, but in my country, gas station owners, they come into agreement to have the same price for gas and diesel. So there's no competition. And the prosecutors, they are always trying to pursue them, criminally speaking, because this is prohibited. Okay, so cartel, for example, is uh, not allowed. So that's an example uh, with a business activity that would interfere with a free market. Okay, dumping prices. Let's say, um, it's important. They want to break small coffee store chains. So they offer price of their goods, any goods, coffee, tea, anything they sell, at a very low price. Even below manufacturing cost. 
because their finish is strong. They can do this for some time. But if it's found out there that their intention was to break some other businesses, this would be prohibited. So there would be both civil and criminal issues against it. For example. Clear? <clears throat> right. So that's the definition uh, we have. And for provincial legislation in terms of uh, consumers, uh, there are responsibility on sellers, victims of unsafe products, they can sue the manufacturer in tort. Why in tort? Because we usually don't buy from the manufacturer. So we don't have an agreement with the manufacturer. And we can also sue under contract law but not the manufacturer, then it will be the seller. So you could sue, let's say Microsoft, let's say you, you purchase a Surface tablet at Best Buy. You have an agreement with Best Buy, so you could sue Best Buy under contract law. But if there were issues with Surface, the product, you could sue Microsoft, the manufacturer, under tort under negligence, okay? Because you have no contract with Microsoft, for example. Uh, what else? False or exaggerated claims, they are not allowed. And there's usually consumer boards in provinces in Canada that they will investigate consumer complaints. And for unconscionable transactions, I also shared this with you already, but I'll just remind you. Let's say I get a loan, and the interest rate in this loan is 60% per year. 60% could be okay in other countries, but not here in Canada. I could pay maybe 15, 20 at maximum, but not 60. So if I came to such agreement, there's a presumption of unconscionable transaction. Why did they come into this? So courts, they may interfere in such agreements. They may correct those uh, transactions. Cost of borrowing money. So it's not that I like, um, what is this, Swarov? And not that I don't like. I just got this example because I found it nice. So we have those small letters in here. This is complying with their obligation to disclose cost of borrowing money. So you may read in here, uh, MSRP 27 plus freight and PDI, air conditioning, and then if you're borrowing money, they usually say uh, total lease obligation will be 14,800 uh, and something, okay? So why do they do this? And if we listen to this on the radio, they speak very fast, right? Other times are conditioned by or not? They do like this because they are complying with their obligation to disclose cost of borrowing money, okay? Door-to-door uh, -door sales, they are restricted not prohibited, but there are some restrictions. One of them is we have a cooling off period. We have 10 days to change our mind if we buy something that was sold from door to door sale. We change our mind and they have to accept. Referral selling. Licensing is mandatory, so professionals, they have to be licensed to work with referral selling. And abusive conduct may be fined. Referral selling is this. Let's say I have a gym place. And I tell you, if you sign up for a membership and you give me contact details of 10 friends, I'll give you a discount. So this is referral selling. I get contact details from others, right? For me to do this, I need to be licensed. And I cannot be abusive. Okay. What else? 
the true cost of borrowing money I uh, showed you already. Misleading information is prohibited. I work for this company uh, in Brazil that started doing business in the US. And it was a medicine, a drug, natural drug, natural medicine. Do you know, do you know anything about homeopathy? Natural product? So there's this French company, not the company I work for, work for a Brazilian one. So I was checking on their label. But there's this French company. They offer this homeopathic product in the US, and in their label it said, um, good for uh, cold and cough. So good for cold and flu. <coughs> in California, there are a lot of lawyers and law firms that are specialists to sue manufacturers and businesses on behalf of consumers. So this French company, they were sued because some patients, some people, some consumers, that purchased their product, they did not recover from their flu or cold. This French company decided to settle the issue, and they paid $5 million to settle, plus they recalled all products from the shelf, from the shelves, and they had to change the label for them. So this is because of misleading information. And in California, anything can be misleading. Because of this case, I advised this Brazilian company I was working for that they should uh, claim in their label like this. It may help, it may help cold and flu conditions. Not treat, not cure, and not will, or not it treats. May help, may help you, may not help me just to protect them from those mostly California lawyers because they are pursuing companies for exaggerated or misleading things. Okay, so just exemplify on this. Money lenders, they also, here in Canada, they have to be registered. So anyone who lenders uh, money, company or professionals, they have to be registered. Okay, this is all protecting consumers. And debt collection agencies, they also have to be registered and licensed. So there's licensing um, bodies for them. And we also have remedies under tort, such as defamation, assault and battery, trespass, even false imprisonment could happen. So this debt collector calls you and your company you are not there in your desk. Someone else, is, someone else answers the call. And the debt collector says, hey, is João there? No, João's not here. Would you like to give a message? Oh, yes, he owns this company, this amount of money. If it is defamatory, if it is derogatory to me, I may sue for defamation. I would be a victim of defamation. Or if the debt collector comes to my house, only my wife is there. And the debt collector says, hey, I'm going to send your, um, your husband to prison if you don't pay me now. So this is duress. This is also a tort. 